There once was a little boy who was sick on a Palm Sunday, and so he stayed home, and uh, his mom took care of him, and his dad went to church, and his dad came back from church with a palm branch in his hand. The little boy was quite curious. He says, oh, what's that for? The dad said, well, son, when Jesus came riding into town, everyone waved palm branches to honor him, and so we got palm branches today. The little boy was kind of puzzled, but then replied to his father, you mean the one Sunday Jesus shows up at church, I was sick? (laughs) And sometimes we have uh, misunderstandings. We have misconceptions, wrong expectations, things not happening as you might have thought they would. Uh, Know this, that God understands. God understands those times that we face when people misunderstand us. God understands those times in your life when, when people's expectations are not reality and, and they, they, they fail you. He understands what it's like to have uh, the pressure put on, so to speak, uh, to be praised one day and then uh, to be kind of let down, well, by the end of the week. And that's kind of what's happening on this particular day here in Matthew 21. I kind of want to set the scene for you a little bit. It's, it's Sunday, uh, about 32 AD. Jesus um, is doing his ministry. He's been doing his ministry for about three years. Jerusalem at this time is jam-packed with about two million people. They're all coming to celebrate the Passover. And the Passover was one of those yearly feasts that every Jew was required to go to. And so all over the world, they would come piling back into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And, and we just got done, well, got done studying about that Passover where the, the lamb was taken, the pure and spotless lamb, and there it was sacrificed and the blood was put on the doorposts and, and the sides and the children of Israel were freed from that bondage of slavery in Egypt. Uh, that was that remembrance. And so they're coming to this place to celebrate it. And Jesus has told his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He actually told them three times he would go to Jerusalem and die and the third day be raised again. But it just kind of all went over their head. So he told them, I'm going to Jerusalem. And so he makes his way down from Galilee, down towards uh, the Jordan Valley, and then crosses over to Jerusalem uh, on the road to Jericho. As he's going, he runs into that uh, uh, little, wee little man, Zacchaeus, and that whole situation takes place. Uh, and, and then as he's leaving the city, there is blind Bart, as we call him, Bartimaeus, who cried out for healing, and Jesus touched him. And so the road from Jerusalem, or from Jericho on towards Jerusalem, uh, it looks like that. Uh, quite barren, but this is millions of people coming in from all directions for these roads heading into the city. And um, he makes his way to Bethany on his way to Jerusalem where he stays with Mary and, and Martha. It's a time where Mary takes that, that uh, dowry payment, that, that spike nard, and pours it on his feet in that act of worship and anointing his body for burial. And then he comes into, uh, uh, from that road, comes up to the Mount of Olives. And, and this is what it looks like today. Obviously, there was no church there or another church over here. There's a lot of churches in Israel. Every place you go seems to be a church. But it was just a, it was a mountain on the east side of Jerusalem. And he comes up over this hill. And what does he see on the other side? Well, this is what it looks like today. It's the eastern gate uh, into the city. Well, today it's, it's blocked off. But through that would be the temple. And that would be where the sacrifices were given. And so Jesus come down from that valley through this city into the temple. And so he's come this way the past three years for ministry. And now he's coming for a different purpose, really to fulfill prophecy. And so let's read our text, chapter 21, and begin to see this this unfold. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before him and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Who is this? It's a question that we all must face. It's a question that was stirring at this time, not only on this day, but in the three years previously, it was brought up at various situations. And we're going to kind of explore some of those today. I want to look at this Palm Sunday text uh, from four different perspectives. There were the, the disciples of Jesus... There were the multitudes with Jesus, the unbelievers of Jesus, and then the Pharisees who were against Jesus. And there's something to learn from each of these perspectives and then seeing how we are to respond even today as we look at these things. So let's look at the, the first one is the disciples, these two disciples in particular. And looking at this question, who is this? What are they discovering about Jesus? Well, look at verses 1 as they're coming there to Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage. And Bethphage is quite interesting. Um, it's, uh, it means house of unripe figs. House of unripe figs. And you could say, well, Lord, how come you didn't send them straight ahead into Jerusalem? There's a lot of people there, a lot of resources there. Go there and get the donkey. Why are you saying go to Bethphage opposite you? Disciples. And uh, I think it's the, the lesson for us to learn simply that God's ways are not always what we see. They don't always make sense to us. And sometimes, well, oft oftentimes, the Lord is working in the big picture. He's doing something you can't see. And, and many times He's working in those places that we would say, oh, you know what, that's pretty unripe. That's not really in the right time. That's not the people you'd want to work with. Here was a place of Bethphage where you would have the lowest and the least and the lost. Maybe it's like Skip Row of today. I don't know. But, but it's a place that's just unripe. No one wants to really be there except Jesus. And maybe in your heart you're there this morning. Maybe through circumstances and situations, outwardly things are A-OK, -okay, looking all right, but inside there's, there's some unripeness. There's some things that you go, man, this is rotten here. Know this, that Jesus loves you, and when others would despise you, he says, there's something useful there for my glory. And as you surrender to him, you find that he does great things. So Jesus gives them this grocery list, so to speak, of items he's seeking to borrow, this donkey and colt, it tells us there in verse 2. Mark's uh, account tells us that it was a, a colt that had never been ridden on. Why is that important? Because through this display, Jesus is showing that he has the power to tame whatever is wild. That he is the God of creation. And in a moment, uh, he can be tamed. It's exactly what he does. And he tells the disciples to bring them to him. It's not the first time Jesus would borrow something. He had borrowed Peter's boat at one point to give a sermon. He had borrowed a little kid's lunch to feed 5,000 plus. Uh, and, and so he's, he's, he's a great, useful uh, resource at hand. He uses them. And he told them, he said, by the way, if anyone asks you uh, what you're doing, just say this, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. I don't think it's one of those Jedi things going on here. You know, the Lord has need of them. You know, and okay, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's just, it's the power of God. But I want you to see this from the disciples' point of view, that, that this is quite incredible. Of course, they had walked with him for three years, but it wasn't to be this forceful thing. You know what? If they won't give it to you, then you flash that Jesus badge and you say, in the name of the Lord, give me your donkey. You know, it's not that type of thing. It wasn't supposed to be in fear and, and manipulation. You know, if you don't do this, then I'm going to miss out on this parade thing that's going on here. You better give me your donkey. He just says, you just say it's for Jesus. It makes you wonder, it makes you think, well, what was God doing in the hearts of these men that were not told in the text? What was he doing? How would, maybe they had seen Jesus work and had observed and maybe their heart was even being stirred. What could I even do for the Lord in this place of Bethphage? He never stops here. And well, what can I do for the Lord? And it was just the work of God. I think even what may be even more incredible, what we don't see what's happening, but what we can relate to in our culture, in how this all takes place, 
is what we're not told. The disciples didn't say what it was to be used for. The, 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 they didn't even say it. They would bring it back. I assume that they would. The owners didn't even ask for donkey insurance or anything like that. They didn't even know if these guys had a license to drive it or whatever they'd had at the time. They didn't know what it was going to be used for, if these guys were going off-roading with these donkeys or if they were going to do the running of the donkeys in Jerusalem or they were going to do whatever. They had no idea. But all of a sudden, all we're told in the text is just say, the Lord has need of them. Okay. That's amazing. It's in, it's, to me, it's absolutely incredible because what we see about who is this, Jesus, for these two disciples, is this, number one, that he's the, he's the wonder-working God. He is the wonder-working God that they've watched for three years, they've walked with for three years, they've worked with for three years. Every day was such a wild experience with Jesus. You never knew if he was going to make lunch for you or if he was going to cast out a demon. I mean, just incredible things. So when he says this, I'm sure they just went, okay, this is just how we roll. You know, <laughs> this is how it goes with Jesus. But see, what strikes my mind is that there was another incident for these disciples where they said, who is this? Earlier, Mark chapter 4, they were in a storm of all storms. They were in a situation that they thought was the end of themselves. They were just run down, exhausted, just at a point of an end. They're in the middle of a storm, and well, Jesus is there in the boat with them, but he's sleeping, sleeping in the storms. Maybe that's how you feel this morning. God, you're sleeping in my storms. The boat's filling up with water. They start freaking out. They turn to Jesus and wake him up and say, Teacher, don't you care? We're going to die here. Jesus stands up, and many of you know this. You've read it. He stands up and just says, Peace, be still. Calms the storm. Turns and teaches the disciples a lesson. The boat filled with water, but their hearts were filled with awe. Because they say in verse 41 of Mark chapter 4, Who is this? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? What a wonder-working God. He is the one that, that heals. He is the one that, that delivers. He is the one that saves. He is the one who can take out the criticism of the Pharisees with just one sentence and send them cowering with their tails between their legs. He's the one who reached the untouchable and touched the lepers and, and healed those who were sick and diseased that had no hope. He set the captives free and preached the gospel. He's the wonder-working God. Who is this that does these things? In fact, every day was such an amazing thing that John tells us in John chapter 21, verse 25, there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that not even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. What a glorious thing. What a glorious thing. Jesus really does have that wow factor. Have you seen Jesus work wonders in your life? Personally? How he saved you? Physically, maybe how he's healed you? Emotionally, how he's comforted you and sustained you? Have you seen him work those wonders? Listen, when you're faced with a situation that you're not understanding who God is in this moment, at this time, and what's taking place, you fall back on what God has done in the past in your life to be the strength and resource in that time that you're in. In verse 6, it says that they went and did as Jesus commanded them. They obeyed not because they totally understood, but they knew the heart of Jesus. He never fails. Now, I don't always understand what God's up to, but I know that when I obey him, that he is bound and determined to glorify his name uh, through our lives. Why such a task? Well, it wasn't just to thrill the disciples it, with what he knew. It was for what was ahead, uh, that they would look to Jesus prophetically. And that's the verses there in verse 4 and 5 out of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 that Jesus lived in light of the word and of the will of the Father and in fulfillment of the scriptures. And after three years of ministry, here's his final offer to the people as king, that they would embrace the king, the long-anticipated and expected Messiah. Interesting that this also was the very day that you would choose that lamb that would be slain for the Passover on Thursday. You would pick it out on Sunday. And the lamb of God is coming into Jerusalem saying, embrace me. I am your sacrifice. 
Prophetically speaking, you could look at it in Psalms 118 that it says to bind the sacrifice to the courts, with courts, to the altar. And it's, it's pointing to Jesus. So it was a great prophetic picture to see here. But it was also to lift up Jesus because personally they needed to see that. And they brought the donkey and colts and they laid their clothes on them and set them on them. And, and we have to remember that whatever you give for the Lord, whatever you lift Jesus up on, whether it's your work or your relationships or your person that you are and your character, listen, God will be glorified in that when you make that sacrifice. So who is this to the disciples? He's a wonder-working God. But what about the multitudes and even the disciples with them? There he is celebrated as a coming king. And there are four things that we can note, even from verse 5, about a, this king who is coming. The first one being that he is a prophesied king. He is prophesied to come. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Daniel chapter 9 tells us this. This was the prophecy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome time. The wall was built in Nehemiah's day and it definitely was a troublesome time. But it's interesting in a book by Sir Robert Anderson called The Coming Prince, he lays this out, which is quite fascinating, that the 69 weeks of seven days would equal 483 days. And the days would not be 483 days from that edict. Of course, nothing happened. But 400, the days turned to years would count 173,880 days from the time of the command to go and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, historically and even biblically, we know that exact date of when that command went out. It was March 14th, 445 B.C. The decree went out from Artaxerxes to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And so at that point, technically, you could start from that day and you could count 173,880 days and the Messiah would be there. Well, you minus your zero year and you go by a Jewish calendar of 30 days not the Babylonian calendar that, that, that we have in, in the Roman calendar today as well. And you come to, quite fascinating, this very day in 32 AD where Jesus is coming in, presenting himself as king. To the T, to the day, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. No, and the Pharisees said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And what did Jesus say in Luke? If they were to be quiet, even the rocks would cry out. Why? Because this day is prophesied in fulfillment of Scripture. To the very day. He's a prophesied king. We have to note that. Multitudes note that. He's a prophesied king. Number two, he's a personal king because it tells us there in our text, behold, your king. Yes, Jesus came for the, the whole world, but he came to the Jews first. And we personally have to recognize that as he, he needs to become my king. And maybe you got the wrong king. Maybe your king has hair like this and he's still going, Whoa. you know, I, I don't know. Maybe your king is Burger King. I don't know. But is Jesus Christ your king? Oh, maybe you'll say he's just a king. And it's quite fascinating that Pilate would say, are you a king? John chapter 18. And then he would question him on his kingdom. And then he would nail a sign above his head when he's crucified that says, this is Jesus, the king. But nowhere along the lines does he say, that's my king. Is he your king? Personally, we must accept him as that. So he's a prophesied king. He's a personal king. And number three, he's a purposing king because it tells us there in our text that he's coming to you. It's not you to him. It's him to you. It's an uphill climb if we were to go that direction. But he descended from heaven itself down to the mud pits of men to be our king. He's coming for a purpose. And what was his purpose? Well, his purpose is really threefold. It's to conquer my enemy, which is sin, death, and hell itself, which he did by way of the cross, to capture my heart, that I would find the great love of God that's so overwhelming, and say, Lord, I surrender to you, and then to control my decisions, that I would say, God, here I am. Use my life for your glory. And may your kingdom be established in my heart. Quite an empowerful king that we serve. At number four, he's a peaceful king because he's there lowly and sitting on a donkey. Understand that this is the ride, so to speak, of princes, of judges, 
in a, of royalty in a time of peace. In a time of peace. Do you see, uh, the, the Romans would use a stallion as a time of war. And, of course, you know, they're a little higher up and they've got a little bit more pomp and pride and they come in from the battles. And that, that's what people would, would recognize as that authority. But here he's coming in, in peace, sitting in humility, a, a servant king. With dignity and royalty, he's called the Prince of Peace. He's very approachable to the common man. Picture this yourself. He's riding on a donkey. This would be like you jumping on the back of your kids. <laughs> your feet are dragging on the ground. <laughs> You're kind of Fred Flintstoning this thing, you know, trying to get it going. He's very approachable, very touchable, very tangible. Because that's how our God comes to us. And it's quite a joyful celebration. He's not just a wonder-working God. He's but a king. Well, who is this moment number two? We'd find that earlier, the multitudes saying this very same thing. In John chapter 12, Jesus has just told the multitudes about being lifted up, that he would die. And they said to him, they said to this, we have heard from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? And the Son of Man was a, a messianic term. It was a term that, that was for the Messiah. How can you say the Messiah was going to die? And then they said, who is this Son of Man? Who is this Son of Man? So this isn't the first time they're asking this question, who is this? In other words, they're absolutely confused about the work of the Messiah. They see him as just coming to rule and reign and miss the fact that he would first come to die. Who is this? I think there are many in the multitudes today that are asking a very similar question. Who is this Jesus? Who is he? Is he just a liar? Is he a lunatic? Is he Lord? Is he just a teacher or a rabbi? Who is this? And why in the world would he die on a cross? You know, and then many of the world looks at it today and says, oh yeah, I know that story. I know that Easter story. Yeah, Jesus came, died on the cross. But they've never stopped to say, well, who is this that's dying on the cross? Is he just a man? A nice teacher? A nice rabbi? Is there something different about him that would call my attention? And Jesus would tell them in John chapter 12 when they said that, he would say, walk with me, walk in my light, believe, and you will become sons of the light. You see, when you've got questions and you're not understanding what God's doing, you're not understanding who even Jesus Christ is, listen, if you just walk with him, he'll reveal himself to you. If you give him time, he will reveal himself to you. He wants you to be in a relationship with him. And that's the cry of his heart. He wants you to recognize him as your Messiah and your king. The third group of people that would, might say, who is this? You have the disciples who realize that he is the wonder-working God. You have the multitudes who would need to come to see that he is the king, the coming king. And then another group of people, though it's not in our text here, are the unbelievers of Jesus. The unbelievers of Jesus. The soldiers are there. The, the Romans are there. Herod is there. Pilate is there. And it, though it's not in our text, we can safely I suppose that they would have gotten word of all this taking place. The soldiers are everywhere to make sure there's peace in the city when the city is flooding over with all these people. Pilate is present here. Uh, by the end of the week, he, you know, he's in the mix of it. Herod is here. And what are these guys thinking about? Who is this? I, I think it's fascinating what, in a sense, what's not there is you think, did it stir them in any way? Did the soldiers look over and just kind of laugh and go, this is silly little Jews. You know, they're king on a little donkey. That's not a king. These people, that's not how you treat that. They probably just, you know, kind of in their hearts just mocked. Obviously, it didn't cause any stirring. Maybe they grabbed their swords and just were ready to go, but eh, nothing. Pilate, Herod, what about them? Obviously, nothing stirred their heart to do anything. They just kind of said, eh, the Jews are at it again. It didn't move them. They recognized Jesus as a man, maybe even a rabbi, but never as a king to submit to. I think it's quite interesting with Herod. He was in Jerusalem at this time. And we get an insight, a peek into his heart. A who is this moment number three? In Luke chapter nine, Herod had put John the Baptist to death. 
the same one. He heard of all that Jesus was doing at that time, and he was a little perplexed because he, he thought Jesus might be John the Baptist raised from the dead. And the Bible tells us there that in the midst of the confusion, Herod said in verse 9, Who is this of whom I hear such things? And he's seeking to see Jesus. But it wasn't until later, hours before Jesus was to die, that Jesus and Herod would come face to face. And he questioned him. Jesus answered nothing, complete silence. Herod was seeking him for, hey, I want to see a show here. Show me one of your miracles, one of your things going on. And when Jesus didn't respond to any of that, he sent him away, give him back to Pilate. I think the point is this. Who is this Jesus? Well, he, he's not a performer. He's not an entertainer. He's not the genie in the bottle or the ATM. He's a savior. And when he doesn't work according to as your expectations are, do you send him away? Just like Herod? I know many people who have said, well, I've tried Jesus and he didn't work for me. You ever heard that before? Let me tell you, he's not a prescription. He's a person. He's not a pill that you take. He's a person that you develop a relationship with. And in reality, what the heart is saying, if God didn't meet my expectations, I am not going to follow him. The rules are backwards. He may not work as you think he would, should work, but let me tell you, he has worked for you. And that's what the cross tells you. That he would go to the extremes for you. That he would die for your sins. That's what the cross of Christ tells us. God is always working a bigger picture than you see. He's more concerned with your character than with your comforts. And so when God's not working as you see fit, don't act like Herod and just go, well, hasta la vista. You're not what I wanted. The fourth group of people is that of the Pharisees, and they were against Jesus. And we read in John's John's and Luke's Gospels, the Pharisees were present at this time during this parade. And rightly so, they're religious leaders. They're there at the Passover, and they're, they're in that working. But what would they think? Well, here's what it says in Luke and John. Luke 19, 39. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. John 12, 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. These guys are jealous, frustrated, critical, Jesus is a threat to them and their whole system. Who is this moment? You might write number four because this was earlier in the Pharisees' lives that they encountered Jesus and said something like that. In Luke chapter seven, Jesus went to dinner at at a Pharisee's home and he's sitting there with all these guys and they're asking him various questions and all of a sudden, A sinful woman just bursts through the door and she comes and falls down at his feet and starts weeping and crying on his feet and wiping his feet with her hair. And and it's just such a scene. And the Pharisees stand back and and they, they, they looked at this whole situation and Jesus used this situation to teach them a story about true forgiveness. And then he turned to this woman and says, Woman, your sins are forgiven you. And of course, this set them off. In chapter 7 of Luke, verse 49, they said this, who is this who even forgives sins? And, that, and that's not a claim of, hmm, wow, amazing. That's a claim of criticalness. It's a claim of, of, you know, of condemnation and accusation. How could you say such a thing? It, it wasn't the wonder of the disciples nor the curiosity of of the multitudes and seeing a king, it was the the condemnation that's coming. Who is this who even forgives sins? And I would hate to see that maybe even some of you are in that boat as well. How could God forgive this person? How could God tell me to forgive this person? Who is this? No, I am not going to forgive. How do you see Jesus? Who is this? 
The hard heart of the Pharisees didn't start at this moment. It started way earlier when they began to criticize Jesus because he was going against the flow, because he was healing people on the Sabbath. And from that hard heart would come the point of where all they could see was away with him, crucify him. These four views, these four things, looking at who is Jesus. But if you've recognized Jesus as your king and you've recognized him as your wonder-working God and you're looking at him and going, he's not there to just perform for me and you're looking at him going, oh, I don't want to be critical. I'm not accusing him of anything. I'm really seeing him of who he is, that he's the king. Well, then how then do I go about to honor the king as he sees fit? What's the worthy way to give him praise? Of course, we see it even in our text that there are three ways that you and I can honor him even today. The first two are what's laid down before him. The second one is what's lifted up to him. What's laid down? Well, in verse 7 and 8, they brought the donkey and they laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And, and this, I don't think it was all 12 of the disciples started laying their garments and he's in a booster chair in the seat of parade. I think he's just, there's two of them on there. It's like a cushioned saddle. And he's riding this. But what are those clothes? Those clothes are that identity. The first thing you lay down to the Lord in honoring him as king is your identity of who you are. You say, Lord Jesus, you rule over my identity. You're the Lord. You're the king of my life. And when people see me, I want them to see you. My identity is laid down. The second thing that's laid down before him is my abilities. Because what did they do? They went and they started to begin to cut branches. They spread their clothes, verse 8, on the road, and they cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And John tells us that they were palm trees, the symbol of peace and rest. Why would they do this? Why is this important in, in my life? How does that relate today? That I need to go down and chop down my palm tree at home and say, here you go, Lord. Well, understand biblically and culturally how this place. When a king came into town, culturally, you would lay down garlands. You would lay down wreaths. You would lay down things as, as a point of saying, your reign is that of peace. Your reign is, is the victory. I'm, I'm preparing the way. I'm making the way smooth for my king. You're the king. Biblically, they began to cut in Leviticus 23. It was during the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall that people would cut down branches and they'd build these booths to celebrate that time that they wandered in the wilderness and God sustained them. Well, we're not at that point, so why are they doing it here on Passover? You might say that they're not looking to the past. They're looking to the future. That on that day, Lord, when we will have peace as you meant it for it to be. The king, the coming king, bringing a final rest and peace to Israel. Jesus, does he have your abilities? Does he have your identity? Three men were asked, they were working at a new building, a new church building, and they were laying bricks. And the guy came up to him and asked, what are you doing? And the first guy said, I'm laying bricks. He says, hmm. The second guy said, I'm building a wall. And the guy said, hmm. But the third guy says, I'm raising a great cathedral. What are you doing with your abilities? And serving the Lord? And building his kingdom? Or are you still holding out and building your own kingdom walls? I lay down my identity. I surrender my abilities. And the third way that we can honor the Lord is really to lift up a melody. And that's what they did. In verse 9, they cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Hosanna means save now. Psalms 118. Not later, not sometime indefinitely, but right now, Lord, be salvation for me. That's the melody to sing. That's what we're going to sing about tonight, and I encourage you to come. But you see God, you see Jesus as your salvation right now. Listen to Psalms 118, 14, and 15. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. You know that Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua, where we get the word Jesus in the Greek? And he has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. What is the melody I'm singing today? What is the, the cry of my heart that I'm lifting up? Is it of myself or is it of the Savior? 
He's the king that has come. And yet I would propose to you this, is that the cries of praise will never go forth as they should until the coats of self are laid down. They'll never reach the intention and destination until the abilities and the greatness of his kingdom is seen and it says, Lord, I surrender. And then at that point, the phrases will lift up high and strong. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One last thing. All the city was moved, it says there. That's the word say. Seo, uh, where we get our word seismic, it was rocked, it was shaken. All the city was moved, and they're saying, Who is this? And sometimes the Lord begins to shake up your life for that very opportunity that others may say, Who is this that is holding you together? Who is this that is being exalted in your life? Who is this that is you're proclaiming as king, as the wonder working God? Who is this that I may? Proclaim him as well. You see, this was a momentary act of worship. Uh, they, people were caught up in all this because by the end of the week, they're crying out, crucify him. They were saying, yeah, let's get caught up in the moment. And some people come to church and that's kind of how it is. We're just caught up in it. I have no clue what we're doing, but I'm here. You know? The Lord wants to press you in even further. But one last, who is this moment? You might say number five, which is very crucial. It was before this time in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus came to his disciples and he said this, who do men say that I am? You remember that? Who do men say that I am? And, and, and Peter basically, he, he takes the recent pew polls and says, well, here's what we found out. The majority of people are looking at you going, um, there's this percentage that say you are John the Baptist. There's this percentage that says you are um, one of the prophets of old. And there's this percentage here that's saying uh, they, they just don't have any idea. The people are totally confused. Even after three years, Jesus, after you've been walking and ministering and healing and doing all these things, no one knows. Boy, that's encouraging. <laughs> Who do men say that I am? Why would he ask for that popular poll, that popular opinion? It was to press G, uh, Peter to this point. But Peter, who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. A and what's fascinating about this, Jesus said, blessed are you, Peter, Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. This didn't come about by popular opinion. This came about from the Spirit of God. Now, now listen, no matter what your opinion is of who Jesus is, there's only one opinion or one statement that will get his blessings. He didn't say, well, blessed are those people that are kind of halfway there and think I'm John the Baptist. Or blessed are those people that think I'm one of those prophets of old. He said, blessed are you, Peter. When you said that statement, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I would tell you even today that when you say, Jesus, you are the Christ, my King, the wonder-working God, the Son of the living God, God manifested in the flesh, you are my Lord, my King, that you're going to be blessed to. Who is this? It makes all the difference in the world. This is Jesus. Hosanna. Save now. Let's pray. Ooh.